thing to ask them, well, how are you getting on? But they're going through some things. And there's some, there's some warriors and some brave people in this meeting. That I don't know if you know them. You need to take time to get to know people. But there's people and they're going through it. Absolutely going through it. But what do we do? And I'm amazed how they get the strength. I used to say to Lord, said, how do they keep going? How do they keep going? But they do. Look at somebody say, so do I. So do I. But they do. So how, how do you face the tragedies of life? You know you're married. Laura and I are married a long time. But you, you know it's just life. One of these days, one of these days that comes to an end. Not marriage, but life. One of the two of us will go home to be with Jesus first. Unless I'm driving as well as I usually drive. Most kids will make go home to, together. <laughs> Especially if you're driving. Anyway, so, so it's like this. It's It's inevitable. You can't stop it. It's on the books. It's one of these things you never think about unless somebody brings it up in a sermon, but you never think about it. But that person who's with you, and Laura and I is with each other all the time, but one of these days, one of the two of us is going home first. It's just the way it is. It's life. And what do you do when that person has been beside you all their life and suddenly they're, in a moment of time they've been taken from you? Your world changes in a second of time. We've all got parents. You can't come into this earth without a parent. But it's inevitable that you're younger, so what's going to happen when that one of your, or both of your parents slip away, pass away, or a brother, or a sister, or a relative, or a friend, when they pass on? One minute they're there as large as life. Even if they're on a sick bed, they're still smiling, they're saying something. But suddenly it's over. So, suddenly they're not in your life anymore, and it's gone, and it's gone forever. How do you cope? What do you do? In moments just like this. How do you handle it? How do you handle it? When, when, you, when you find the love of your life, or, or you believe it's the love of your life anyway, and, and you're making all the plans to get married, and suddenly they come and say, I'm having second thoughts now. What do you do when your heart's broken? What do you do when they slip the engagement rig off and send it back on the post? Maybe don't admit, not even man or woman enough to look you in the eye. They just send you a tax message. Adios, amigo. They called it in the old days a Dear John letter. You've ever heard of a Dear John letter? It's called a Dear John. Ha, I hate to write, but I don't love you anymore. And that, that happens all the time. Laura and I deal with this all the time. But the, the, when, the, when the movies make about it, and, and it, it's called a chick flick, and they all cry and they get together again. Normally they don't get together again, and there's a lot of tears shed, but it's brokenness. And there's somebody in that party that will never be the same again except the Spirit of the Lord touches them. So what do you do when the engagements broke off? Or you, you don't get, you get walking down the aisle and suddenly it's disrupted or whatever. What do you do? Because then you've got to go back and tell your family and your friends it's not on. What are you going to do if your spouse after many years walks out on you? What are you going to do if there's a betrayal and suddenly they're not in your life anymore and you give them everything, you give them all your time and suddenly they're gone? How do you cope? And let me tell you, say, oh, I, I can hardly wait. No, no, you, you've never seen it in action, or you would never say that. Oh, I tell you, I wish mine would leave me. No, you don't. No, you don't. Now, you wish it would be better, and they probably wish you would be better too. Things can, there's ways and means around this. But when it happens, it's not like you think. There's, there's heartache, there's crisis, there's tragedy. There's more than them two people just involved. There's the family connected to them. There's the friends. And it's not an easy deal. And what do you do when you go to the doctor with a simple pain in your ribs? What do you do when you go with a simple migraine or a little bit of confusion in your mind? What do you go when the doctor says, can you sit down a minute, take a deep breath, I'd like to talk to you. But that headache's not a headache, it's a brain tumor. That that pain in your side is not just appendicitis, but we're so sorry to tell you it's colon cancer. What are you going to do? How you face it in the times of crisis. Because we deal with people all the time. And we see the rough edges of it. We just don't see the phone call where somebody says, my sister has, no, we're, we're right there with the people who's crying, who's wailing, who, who's clutching at straws of life and wondering how are we going to make it through. And there is a way. This is why I want to preach this. What are you going to do when an accident comes? Because we know people all the time and met a lot of people both here and in other nations and they make great plans and you're supposed to. I hope you made plans for your future, Rabbi. You made great plans, absolutely. You make plans for your future. But let me tell you, life is so uncertain. Life is so uncertain. We'll, we'll build a wee garden. We'll build a lean-to on the side and suddenly somebody falls off a ladder. Suddenly somebody slips on a banana leaf on the floor down and cracks their head and suddenly they're sitting in a the corner not able to move. What are you going to do? 
when life doesn't turn up the way that it's planned? What are you going to do in their moments? How are you going to find strength to go on? Well, this is why the Bible's here. It's here to help. If, if you're in this predicament, then I'm talking directly to you. Just close everybody off. It's like me and you having a one-to-one -one here. If it's not, maybe it's somebody listening on YouTube or whatever, but there's somebody going through it, and you need to hear. And if you're not here and all these people's going really well, look at somebody say, you're looking good this morning, and you're going through, that's fantastic. Well, then learn these things. There's only really seven points, and I'm going to share them with you. <clears throat> I'm going to take them this morning from a little not-so-well-read book of the Bible. But there's a man in the Bible uh, who asked the same question, how am I going to get the strength? Where are we going to get the strength to go on? This man asked the same question. It's a man called Jeremiah. And he lived through a, a time, a period of history, the history of the Jews, the history of the Hebrew people, and one of the most horrendous periods in the history of the, of the nation of Israel. Uh, and it's when the enemy had come in, and they ravished the entire nation. They slaughtered, they butchered, they raped. And whoever was left standing, man, woman, boy, girl, child or donkey, was taken into captivity. The whole nation was taken into captivity and they were removed from their very homeland. They had nothing. Israel, the nation of Israel was no more. They didn't have it. And, and during the lifetime of this man called Jeremiah, he's one of the major prophets, he also is known as the weeping, the weeping prophet. He wept for his nation. I don't think he just woke up one day and said, you know what, well, I think I'm going to pray for my nation. I don't even think he was that way inclined. The Spirit of God came upon him. And I think the Spirit of God was weeping through him for a nation. And he was carrying the burden of a nation. He carried prophecies. He carried warnings. And he was the one that said, your time, the season of favor is about to come and told them before it, before it ever had. But he lived through some of the worst atrocities that human beings could ever put up with in that period of time when he's live with. And it wasn't happening to somebody on television. We see atrocities on the television. It doesn't really hit you because they're not your friends. But Jeremiah watched his family. He watched his loved ones. He watched his friends. He watched these atrocities happen right to his own people. How does he cope? What do you do? And he wrote two books. One of them is called the book of Jeremiah that most people don't read so often. The best way to read it is in a, a, a more modern translation. If you try to read it in the King James, you'll get so caught up you'll not understand what it means. Best way is to take like the Living Bible or the New Living Translation. That way it reads like a book and you can read it. You'll get a better understand. He also wrote another little book called the Book of Lamentation. Look at somebody say, I didn't know that was in the Bible. <laughs> I understand. I'm with you this morning. It's okay. But there's another little book in there called the Book of Lamentations. Lamentations are weeping unto God. And he wrote also wrote the Book of Lamentations. And this teacher, I want to do this this morning out of the Book of Lamentations. I've read it and read it and read it. And, and when it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in King James, you should go for several other translations. But I have the message for you this morning. Lamentation chapter 2. If you don't know where it is, it'll be up on the screen. If he can, if she can find it on the computer. It's in there. Everybody shout, it's in there. Lamentations. The best way to do is go back to the index on your Bible. Don't try to be a show off. Just go to the index and look up LAM and then look at number 1,253 and flick to your pages and everybody will see the genius in you. You gotta, you gotta read these things because one day you're going to have it and, and Jeremiah will walk up and say, what do you think of my book? And you're gonna turn around and say, well, what book? He said, Lamentations, Lamentations. He said, well, 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 I never really got time to read it. <laughs> He's going to be disappointed. You've got to read it. Book of Lamentations, chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, this is out. I'm going to read this. You've probably got a, 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 a what do you call it, King James's. But this is out of the New Living Translation. Now, listen to these words. Here's a man going through the trials and rigors of it for his nation. He says, I have cried until tears no longer came. I mean, what is, what is he facing? Have you ever cried, we use the term, say, cried bitter tears. Have you ever cried and cried and wailed because and, so, you lost somebody, somebody walked on you, the bitterness of heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have cried. The Bible talks about David. He said he cried until there was no tears left to cry. Have you, have you ever been there? You just, just one time up and down. If you haven't, well, you've, you haven't lived too long. But you will, sooner or later, you'll hit this point where you've cried. He said, I cried until, until the tears no longer came. I had no tears left in me. I had cried and cried and cried myself empty. He said this, my heart is broken. My heart is broken. 
My spirit is poured out as I see what is happening to my people. And I read that, just in an ordinary reading, I read that and I saw that and I said, oh God, what, what was this man going through that he wasn't crying? He, was, he watched his loved ones being butchered, killed and taken into captivity. How did he feel? Broken hearted. And I knew that then, right then I needed to speak to people this morning that would be going through this. I got, I got seven points. I, I, I really hope to get to them. I don't want to spread it into two messages. One be this on one CD. So we'll go through it really quick. But here's, how I, here's the seven keys to coming through what to do, where to get strength to go on. Number one is focus your attention on God. Everybody shout, focus your attention on God. You see, it's all right for me saying that this morning when things is going well and your wife's smiling at you and you're going to have fish and chips for dinner. It's wonderful when you have money in the bank and the car starts in the morning and everything's going good. But what are you going to do when your world falls apart? Because let me tell you something, the hardest thing to do is focus on the master. It's the hardest thing to do because your, your mind's in a million directions. You want to phone him. You're going to phone her. You want to talk to him. You want a human voice to talk to just to pour it out onto you. And those are natural, natural feelings. But let me tell you, one of the most vital and most important thing you need to do is immediately focus your attention to God. Get away. Get alone. Get away from the noise. Get away from the hustle of it and get alone. Make time to be quiet. You've got to do this. Firstly, you've got to do this. You've got to get alone with God and then learn how to listen to Him. Uh, you know, it's easier now to do it whenever we're not up against the problems. Everybody has problems, but I'm not talking about major crisis. It's easier to learn to do this now when you're not up against it than having to learn to do it in the midst of it. But anyway, pick this up. You have to, the person who I'm talking to, you have to learn to get alone with God. Forget about what your doctor's saying and the psychiatrist's saying and what your great aunt twice removed saying. Forget about that. Get alone with God immediately. He is alone. He alone is your source. He's your help. He's going to direct you through this. You're coming out of it. You will make it. Everybody shout, you will make it. And here's what he said in, in Lamentation chapter 3 and verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, but his compassion faileth not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh. It is, it is, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke of his youth. He putteth his mouth to the dust so that there, there may be hope. He said, in other words, he puts his mouth, he bends right over. He's, he's, he's bent before the Lord. He's bound before the Lord to do that, that there may be hope. He's sitting alone. He keepeth quiet because he has borne it upon him. Here's what the Bible's saying. If you get alone, God will sustain you. If you get alone, the goodness of God will come upon you. If you don't do this, believe you me, one little scripture reading before you go to bed is not going to cut it when you've cried till there's no tears left to cry. You've got to get alone with God. Don't forget now you're in the biggest battle of your life. The enemy may have slain him, took them, they might have left you. And immediately there's forces from hell will come and tell you, you're a loser, you'll never get any better, you're ugly, nobody likes you, you will never make it through, you're going to be left like an old widow for the rest of your days. The enemy will lie to you. He has you in a vulnerable spot, spot right now. And he'll tell you, you might as well just kill yourself and die. You might as well, you're finished. How are you going to live? Where are you going to get the money? All these floods. You need to get out of that scenario fast and into the presence of God. You need to get alone, lock that door that nobody can send there and get before God and say, God, I'm here. You're my help. You're my refuge. You're my strength. I'm going to wait before you talk to me. Tell, call, get all this madness out of my head. You talk to me. And God then, the Bible says, he will begin to get hope on the inside of you. It's only when you get alone that you'll really get revelation. You won't get information from your uncle and from your cousin. That doesn't cut it. I know it's nice, but it doesn't work. When you get alone, suddenly you'll have a thought from the Lord. You'll read something. A revelation will come to you. God himself, the Holy Spirit, will begin to talk to you in a way that you'll know it wasn't him, her, or it. And you'll come out of that room. You'll not be smiling. You're still broken, but you've got answers. And now there's a little glimmer of hope. Maybe it will work. And, and, and everybody around will come back and pat you back and say, ah, oh, there, there, there. But you won't even listen to that now because you will have hope from the master. It is in the quiet place. And you don't get it on the first time in. He'll comfort you. But the more you get alone with the Lord, he'll begin to direct your paths. 
He'll give you direction. He'll bring people into your life. He'll open doors. He'll close doors. He'll bring direction. He will give you revelation about your future. That's called hope. When everybody else will say, this is hopeless. And God will tell you, say, no, it's not. I got a brighter future from, if you think you've lost this now, we see what you're going to gain now that you're walking with me. He'll bring revelation about your future. And you know what he does? And this is surprising because I've talked to people who's been through this crisis. You know what they do? Somewhere in the midst of about all their problems and talking and revelation and hope coming back, they start to identify with other people who's going through the same thing. They usually say, now I know how they felt. I never knew. I used to say it'll be all right, but really, I, I used to say to them, I know what you feel, but I never know until now. And you see, now that I'm in this, Father, I know what they're feeling. So, oh God, will you touch them too? And you'll find when you're in there, the self begins to die, and you end up starting to pray for other people. God will train you right in the midst of how to help other people out of it. But you've got to focus your shift back onto the Lord. This tragedy, this crisis has come in. It's just simply moving you away from the Lord. It's moving you away from the thing. It'll get you to question. Does God really heal? Is God really doing it? Did, 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 did I hear? The enemy comes in to try to quest, get you to question God. That's why you've got to get alone, alone uh, get away from him. You, when tragedy comes, it shifts your attention from the peace and the subtlety of God. It just moves, moves your whole attention. You have got to regain that fast. And the whole thing to do is get back to that place. Get alone with God. Number two is ask God to remove your fears. Ask God to remove your fears. And when the crisis, tragedy, whatever it may be, it hits. Let me tell you, you go through a, 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 a ream of emotions. You cry, you get bitter, you get angry, you get frustrated. Oh, there's a whole bunch of emo- emotions kick in over, within weeks and days. You go through this whole emotional thing. Some people have it, I'm talking about grief. There's some people has this, they, there's a science and an art behind it, and they have it measured to the five stages of grief. You go through this stage for about six weeks, and then you're over onto this stage. So counselors can recognize what stage you're in right now. They know, hey, if you just hang on, that'll pass to the next. No, I, I know all them things, and that's that you can analyze life. I'm not here to analyze life. I'm here to find the answers, how to cope. And I'm going to tell you something. If you will run to God and talk to that person, first of all, tell them it's vitally important that you start to personally get along with God. Even if you're only in there five or ten minutes, the peace of God will come, the revelation, comfort will come, and hope will come back unto you. But tell them this, they have got to remove the fear from their life immediately. Fear is the most damaging of all emotions. It become, it can be driven by a spirit of fear. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 55 says this one. He says, I'll call upon your name. He's in there praying now. He said, I will call upon your name, O Lord, out of my low dungeon. He's in a very low place in his life. And I heard my voice uh, 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 and, and hid not your ear from my breathing and at my cry. So he said, God, you heard me. Some kind of answers came. Here's what he said, verse 30, 57. The next verse says, And you drew near in that day that I called upon you, and you said, so what's God, what's, what is God going to say? What little piece of advice is God going to give you in the midst of your tragedy? And he says, here's what God says, and you said, fear not. Everybody shout, fear not. So one of the first things God said to Jeremiah in his crisis is, here's number one. Get this on your list, son. Number one is stop being afraid. Get the fear out. Well, I don't know how I'm going to cope. Well, God does. God does start trusting in the Lord. There's a lady, and she was a, an advice columnist. You know the way we call them the aunties? You know the way they have the columnist people write in, dear auntie, and, and well, there's a famous one, and, uh, and she wrote this. And, and somebody, they said she was receiving 10,000 letters a day asking advice, so she would post them up in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Times magazine, and she would post them up and that for people to read. And somebody asked her, they said, out of all the things you were asked about, what was the most common problem that people had? And she said, without hesitation, she said, fear. Fear. Fear will attack the minute the crisis said fear will attack. There's three antidotes to fear. There's only three, and it is, it's truth. Everybody shout truth. The second one is love. Shout love. And the third one's called faith. There's only three weapons you can use against fear. That is truth, love, and faith. And they're all wrapped up in the Bible. They're not wrapped up in medication. They're wrapped up in the Scriptures. The Word is truth. Jesus is truth. And, and let me tell you something, the love of God, because that, that, you'll start to get better, but you, you have to fight that. That's a force that's coming against you. Let me tell you, there's a, and you say, well, how am I going to get a hold then of truth and love and faith? It's real easy. It's called in a relationship with God. You've got to get along with God. 
When you get alone with God, you will get that relationship. The Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord. That means he had an intimate moment. He was spent in time with God. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all of my fears. There's your answer. You've got to get alone with God. You've got to get alone with God. Let me tell you, sitting at home is not going to do it. Just talking to everybody is not going to do it. You've got to get alone with God. I noticed when I was reading through the Bible again from the book of Deuteronomy how God brought the children of Israel out. And God brought them into the promised land at a time when he said it was just the time of the, of the, 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 the what's the way to put it, the, the fully ripe grape season. So when the grapes of that nation was ripe, that's their harvest, the grape harvest. And God says, God brought them in the, the, the first day they went into the promised land. It was in a harvest time. He brought them in as a harvest time of the full ripe grapes. Let me tell you something. All they ever wanted was right there. But God didn't take the grape and put it in their mouth. He said, no, I brought you in now. You've got to learn how to pick it for yourself. This, let me tell you, that that you're going through is not going to go away on its own. It is set up to destroy you. And you have to do the things yourself. The blessing is there. Relief is there. Hope is there. But you must, must, must. You must get alone with God. And secondly, you must cancel your fears. Get, talk them over for the master. Say, I'm afraid of my future. I don't know what. Talk it over with him. He will bring hope back into you. Number three, you've got to believe that God will restore you. You have to believe that God. Expect him. Really expect God to do something to bring you through this. He may not be able to fix this up. A person's dead, they're dead. He may not be able to get them back again. And even the, the, the who knows what goes on. But let me expect God to do something on your behalf to bring you through this crisis. Do you, do you think he could do that? Well, you have to do it. Expect and trust God that will and believe that he will help. Let me give you this. In Psalm 27 and verse 13, it says, I would have despaired. Unless I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I would, the King James has said, I would have fainted, except I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. He said, I'd have given up if, if I didn't think that I was going to see an end to this. So you've got to believe that there is an end to this and God will restore it. I need to tell you this God specializes in new beginnings. And if you're at a crisis, and the reason you're in a crisis, you had a dead end, the end of the road, you, that person's not there, you're not there, whatever way, the job is finished or whatever it is, and you're at a crisis. Let me tell you something, God specializes in new beginnings. Look at somebody say, I'm in for a new beginning. There's three things you don't need to do and there's two things you do need to do. So write these down. First one is you don't need to, re to repress your grief. You don't need to stop and, and say, well, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not hurting, I'm not hurting. No, stop that immediately. That builds up on the inside. It'll do you more damage. You need to cry. Look at somebody say, it's okay to cry. You're, uh, listen, fellas, you're not a big baby because you burst into tears. Cry if you must. It's a release. It gets it out of you. Sometimes, sometimes people, the best, I tell them, I say, I weigh up the more mountains and scream at the moon. Sometimes you just got to scream at a tree. Sometimes you just got to get it out of you. Don't, don't repress it. Don't hold it. Let them cry. Turn them to say, I'm sorry I'm crying. No, you say, just go ahead here. Use my hanky too. Hold on, I'll cry with you. Help them. Don't, rep don't keep it in. Let it loose. And don't resign from life. Don't withdraw. Don't lock yourself. Pull the curtains and say, oh, that's me. I'm not talking to anybody. Stop that. Stop that. They're the, they're the work of the enemy. No, don't repress it anymore. Cry if you must. Laugh. And people say, well, how can I? People think I'm nuts if I laugh. Laugh anyway. They're not going through what you're going through. Don't keep it in. And don't withdraw from life. Don't pull the curtains. Open the curtains. Get out there and dust. Get up there. Put a bit of makeup on, fellas. And get out there. And, 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 and get out and, and take the dog for a walk. Don't, don't hide in a cupboard. And don't, re, don't, don't listen. And don't retreat into resentment. Don't let bitterness in. It's your choice. If you've got all them thoughts, I hate them, I hate them. I, I, well, if you've got them choices, let me get back into the prayer room and say, God, i got this better. I need rid of it. And get it. stay in there until you get it out. Don't let them things to destroy you. Here's what you need really to do is accept some changes in life. There is a, something's happening. You can't fix it. It's outside of your control. And you've got to accept some things. This is the way it is. Look at somebody say, it's the way it is. It's the way it is. And don't, here's what's important number two is don't focus on what's left because that's where the enemy gets you. He was the breadwinner, she was the breader, now they're gone and I'm left. I'm left. Don't focus on what is, don't focus on what's left. Focus on where you're going 
and what God can get, to, get through to you with. Number four is remember, some things never change. And the Lord never changes. There's things that you see in life, we build up patterns in life, and they're the constants. It's always there. When you come home, your tea's always ready. Or not. <laughs> you know, it's just the way of life. You know where the switch is on the wall. You know the car. You know, yes, there's some constants in life. And we build our life on the constants, the things we know is there. Now, when, when tragedy comes, those patterns of life is gone. It's gone. And you have got to start and rebuild your life. And put patterns back in there as fast as you possibly can. But you got to understand there's some things that becomes anchors. There's some things will never change and they're there forever. And that's what you hold on to. Look for the things that never changes. Get a hold of them and they become an anchor in your life. You got to remember God never changes his mind. He never changes his purpose. And he never changes his, na- his nature. If he said it, he'll always be. He can't help but love you. And you got to look for them, them anchors in life and hold on to them no matter what comes. Number five is remember that God is, in still, is, is still in control. He is still on the throne. He is still in control. He's still calling the shots, even though it looks like he's not. He is. Look at somebody say, he's still in control. He has the whole world in his hands including your world. He has your world in his hands. He was probably trying to warn you three months ago that this was coming, so when it hits, it wouldn't devastate you. But for whatever reason, you couldn't hear it, so you're right in there. It doesn't mean God said, Huff, look at that, I'm out of here. No, he's with you. He's still reaching to you. He's still helping you. He's got your world in his hands. Let me tell you, things happen. And the Paul, said, I, Paul said in the Bible, he said, I'd like to tell you the things that happened unto me. God turned them all around for the blessing and for the blessing of the gospel. The story of Joseph was written in there that you could read, even if you find yourself in a pit, there's still a palace that God can get you to. And it's a miracle how he got him out of the pit and over to the palace. But it's simply telling you the pit is not the end. Look at somebody say, the pit is not the end. The pit is not the end. God is still in control. All things work together for the good of them that love God and serve his purpose. The Bible says he always, he makes a way in the wilderness and he makes rivers in the desert, including this that you're going through. Now, everybody has a free will. God does not impose his will on anybody. So those people that's come against you or whatever, why doesn't God stop them? Because they have a free will. And right now they have given themselves over and made some real bad choices and given themselves over to things. But let me tell you, the end result still lies with God. He is still on control. You cannot help what's coming right now, but God can. And he has the final say and he always works things out in your favor. Look at somebody say, in my favor. It looks like it's a million miles away and you think, well, why hasn't it done? Stop complaining. Look at somebody say, quit your whinging. I know you wanted to say that from early this morning, so I just give you liberty to do that. that, that. But it's still, God has it in control. Well, I can't see it, but you're not God. He's just saying, hold on, keep moving, keep smiling, keep loving, keep giving, keep doing. I'm there. I'm not lost control. I've not turned a blind eye. I haven't got double vision, dark glasses on, can't see what you're doing. He knows exactly where you are. Everything is in control concerning him. He has it. The reason we fear, we fear, if it's in our control, we don't fear it. We fear it when it gets outside of control. And we don't have control. We don't, we don't, we don't uh, have control over what family we were born into. We didn't have a say-so and control over where we were born. We, we didn't even have a control over the natural gifts and talents that we have. We don't have control over the economy. There's, there's higher powers that work it all out. We learn how to work in it. But, but there's higher powers that operate. We can't control the weather. They say the governments can. They're not telling you, but they can shift things. And that's why they've messed it up at the minute. But you can't control your past. And you can't even control your future. You can't, control, you can't even control what's going to happen to you today. You don't know what's going to happen to you today. But God can. And God's right in there. And he's in our past. He's in our present. He's in our future. He's working things out for us. He has not lost control, not for one minute. Now, it's the areas that we can't control. That's where we get afraid. That's where the enemy operates, when it's outside of your control. And you've got to remember straight away and tell yourself regularly, I don't have control, but God does. And as long as God has control, he's my daddy, this will work in my favor. There's many things you can't control. There's several things you can. And number one is your attitude. Look at somebody say, he's talking about your attitude. You can control your attitude and you can control your response. How you respond to this that's hitting you will decide if it's staying or going. 
How you, uh, your attitude in it, or sometimes it's your response to it. You have got to learn how to respond. It's the only part of control you have. And if you can't control that, then you've lost all control. And if you say, no, 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 I can't really control all that, but I can control how I'm going to smile at this or not. I can control about what I think about my tomorrows, and I'm going to daddy, for he has full control over all these things. And if you begin to do that, you will find it. You'll find things will begin to work. Jeremiah uh, uh, says this in Lam- Lamentation 5 and verse 17 and verse 19. I put them together. It says this. We are sick at our very hearts. We can hardly see through our tears. But you, O Lord, are king forever. You will rule to the end of time. In other words, you're still in control. Everybody shout, God's still in control. Number six is this. We're getting through them nicely. There's one more after this. Number six is this. He still loves me. You, you got to remember. You better remember this if I'm talking directly to you. He's, and say this to yourself. He still loves me. And he's never going to stop loving me. He still loves you. Because when Christ is said, they don't love you anymore. They come and tell you, 25 years of marriage, gone in a flash. Love the children. Don't love you. Leaving you. Find somebody else. Or, or, or just death steal somebody away. Uh, you know, the, the enemy will come in with this emotion that nobody loves you. Who's going to love you now? Look at, look at you, you're 38. <laughs> Who's possible? Who's ever going to look at you again? Coming 39 next year. That's you on a shelf for it. Look at somebody say, catch yourself on. <laughs> 39. We know people that got remarried at 83. Look at somebody say, there's hope, there's hope. 83. All right. So quit writing yourself off. But understand this because those words may have penetrated deep when somebody said, I don't love you anymore. I just don't love you anymore. They cut. Those words, those words you, may well have, you might as well have opened your chest and let them tattoo that on your heart because that does not go away easy. That penetrates. A lot, of, a lot of children are ruined because mommy and daddy said, we don't want you, we don't like you, you're a nobody, you'll never make it, we're giving you away. And a lot of children end up the rest of their life with no love here, can't understand when they say heavenly father because their earthly father hated them, didn't take anything to do with them, and they run through the rest of their life. They're usually by teenage years to become so rebellious that life can't handle them. They'll get easily mixed up in drugs and drugs running, etc., and their life is over unless they get born again simply because Somebody said the wrong thing in an early stage of life. And God says, you remember this, son, no matter what happens, no matter what they say, I still love you. I will always love you until you come up here with me. I'll always be with you. Look at somebody say, God loves you. Here's what it says, Lamentations chapter 19 to verse 23. I'm reading this one out of the Message Bible. Jeremiah said this, I'll never forget this trouble. The utter lostness. Is Is that an English word? Is it lostness? I don't think so, but it's in the Bible. It's in the message translation. He said, I'll never forget this trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison like that I had swallowed. I remember it all. I I, I feel like that feeling of hitting the bottom. Have you ever felt like you just hit an all-time low? That feeling of hitting the bottom. He says, he says, but there's one thing I remember, and, I, and remembering it will keep a grip on hope. And here it is, that God's loyal love cannot run out. His merciful love cannot dry up. He's created it new every morning for us. How great is his faithfulness. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. If you feel like you're rejected, nobody cares. Remember this. The one who created you loves you with an ever, everlasting love. You've got to remember that because you might be the one I'm talking to who's lost in love, as they say, and you feel like nobody loves you. You don't even love yourself anymore. Get a grip on yourself. God sends a message directly through to you, to Jer- through Jeremiah, through the book of Lamentation. He says, I will love you, and I will never, ever stop loving you. Wow. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Them accidents are not punishments from God. I know there's platforms in this country, and there's preachers. There's preachers, and they'll get up, and they tell you that God's punishing you. That's, that's, that's from the pit. That is from the pit. I don't punish my kids. I don't, sometimes you want to shake them, 
But I don't, I don't lock them in the coal shed. I don't bring cancers on them if I had a building. I don't do that to say, there, you rascal. No, if you love somebody, you'll do everything. You'll set up the medicine. You'll sit up all night. You'll wipe the sweat from their brow. You'll take them to the hospital. You'll do whatever you have to do. And your heavenly Father is so committed to you because he loves you. He doesn't like what's happening to you. Sometimes he doesn't like what you're doing. But that has not altered the fact he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. Quit blaming God for the decisions that other people's made. Some people's demon-inspired words, and they leave you, and they hurt you, and they say things, and, and they steal from you. Let me tell you, that wasn't God. God never instigated that. He's there now to help you. He's there to talk to you and to help you through the crisis of life. And here's number seven. The last one is this, and remember this, that God is really all you need. And usually you'll find that it's when you got nothing left and everything's gone and all hope's gone and you're sitting in a heap in the, in the floor. You've got to remember this, that really at the end of the day, God is all you need. There's good people out there and they'll try to help, but they can't be there all times. But you need to remember that God is your source. And really at the end of the day, he's all, this is why he said at the very, number one was just, come on into my presence. Come on, sit in my knee. Come on in for a wee cup of tea. Come on and sit here with me a while. Shut off from all that. Come on. You want to cry a while? Come on, sit and cry in my presence. You, you, you want to give off? Come on, give off in my presence. You want to come in and scream a bit? Come on, scream. I've heard you before. I give you the voice box anyway. Come on, come on. Come on in here. You want to whinge and moan? Come on in, my, come on in here. Sit here for a minute or two and whinge and moan. Get it out of your system, Joe. I've, I, I went in there at times when, when going through things, and you know how it is, you're going through emotions. I went in there, and, and the first thing I said was, devil, you have nothing to do with this conversation. I shut you out right now. That, that what I'm about to say to my heavenly father is between my heavenly father and you, and you have no, get out of my life. Get out of, the, get out of this room. And I'll sit there and say, I'm a mess. <laughs> I'll sit there and just open. Have you ever just, just opened to God? And said, now, there's not going to be much faith talk for the next five minutes, but let me tell you, says, I'm hurting. And I, I, I'm hurting that much now, I, I, I don't even know where I'm hurting from. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this, and I, I'm, I'm fed up with this, and where's this, and I, I can't have this. You, you can't talk like that without a devil listening. So I take authority and put him out first, and then I get in there, and I have an old complaint, right, to just me and Daddy. Just, what do you think of that? And God never turns around and says, you are headed on, son. No, he usually turns around and says things like, great is my faithfulness. I'll anoint you. Real success is coming. See, I don't need to hear that right now. I want to hear you're going to kill him. I want to hear you're going to set his bootlaces on fire. I, I want the dog to bark for the last time. But he never says that. He just, I think he just smiles in the, on the throne and says, have you finished? Have you finished? <laughs> he just said, you have to get it out. But why go and talk to some sinner? Why go and, my, you're a believer, why sit and talk to some psychologist, some Catholic who's taking notes on a computer and never goes away, that you're ranting and raving for 20 minutes, and in 14,000 years in the pull out your file and say, here was a crazy one over here. You're not crazy. Not crazy. You were just having a heated moment. You were having a bad day. No, God knows you have a bad day. God knows you got frustrated. I would rather take my frustrations out in the privacy, in the private place with my heavenly Father who knows me and sit and cry and whinge in His presence and then wipe my tears and say, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Now, thank you, Jesus. The answer is on this way. If you go in and whinge and moan and then get it over with real quick and then get the good stuff going, you can walk out of there unloaded and downloaded for heaven and life will work for you. There's nobody perfect. You've got to have a whinge. Look at somebody say, I know, I know, I know. There should be a national whinge day when, every, when everybody was. But you cannot do that openly. You can't go and do this to people. You can't just unload the people of God. They, they'll never forget that one moment of crisis in your life. They'll, they'll forget about the thousand years of wonderfulness that you've always spoke, and they'll only remember the one-off moment you have. So you can't afford to have that in front of people. That's why God says, come on in with me, son. You can just be yourself. You can take your shoes off. You can even take your socks off. You can sit in the chair, put your feet up and talk to me. You want to lie on the floor, Joe? Whatever way you just lie down, Joe, but talk to me. And get it out of you. Get it out of you. And then have that response, the faith response come. You'll never carry the truth. You can't carry fears and faith at the same time. So talk it over. 
Say, far, far, full of fear. I don't know what. I don't know where the money's going to come from. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm a widow now. Where am I going to get the money? I, 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 I never filled a form, and I don't know how to. Fill. Oh God, help me! Listen, if you just go and tell them all your fears, and then say, Father, but I come to you for help. So I'm believing you're on my side. I'm really expecting you to do something. You would be surprised who'll call at your door, who'll do what, and and, and things will happen. You. Know, I was talking to a man just last night. His wife has she has battled cancer for 14 years. It's come and went and come and went and she's beat it and defeated it until the last time it hit was 14 months ago and it came with such a devastation that, that she's, she's alive but she doesn't have quality of life that you would really hope for. And uh, 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 at the end of it, he, he, he said to me, he said, Joe, he said the other day, I said, well, how's she doing now? He said, it got scary. He said, I was sitting there talking to her and he said, she just was like a zombie. He said, I, I'd ask her a question. She'd just stare straight past me. I, and, and I called her by name and I said, I said are you alright she never asked she just stared straight past me she said she's never done that in her life before he said, he said I tell you the truth a, a, a fear rose up inside me I said what's this has something has she took an, another loud what is going on in here he said it scared me and, and I said what did you do he said I, I, well, I went to the phone I phoned the doctor he said somebody come down and look at my wife well they know her in the area they come down the doctor look I said I, I don't know what's going on uh, he says, but he says, I saw somebody phoned this morning. There's, there's a, a, a nurse, a specialist nurse, a male nurse, who's, who's just come into the area, and he comes around and he checks people's medications. He said, I see, see you're on the list for it. He said, I'll just phone him and tell him to hurry up. And so this male nurse came in. He said, never met him before. He says, says he never even explained. He just came in, and he, he looked at my wife. He said, and he says, hello, called her by name, and he said she never responded. He just turned to me, and he says, let me see your medicine. He says, I brought down the medicine. I brought down this one. And he looked at that. He says, how long has she been on this? He says, oh, several weeks now. He says, this one and this one together are lethal. He said, she should not even be on that medication. He said, this one mixed with this one gives you the exact same symptoms as Parkinson's disease in the final stages. In Parkinson's disease in the final stages, you stir like a zombie. He said, that's what's wrong with her. He says, let me just remove these two medications. I give you this one instead. He says, these two together are lethal. He said, who prescribed? He said, well, we'll not go into all that detail. He removed it. I said, Joe, I said, how's, how's it going now? He says, she's coming back now, little bit at a time. He said, I don't even know who he was. Never left his call card, never left his name. He said, I, we've been dealing with this for years. Nobody ever came to check the medicine. Wasn't it something else? That just the right person turned up at the right time I expect God to turn up at the right time with the right person now I don't understand the timings altogether why he doesn't do it three years ago but all I know is this I'm not giving up are you going to give up no we could be that close it's the right person coming into your life and saying ha ha you're wonderful you could have somebody who'll just walk in and think you're the bee's knees you, you could, well, somebody could just be round the corner now who's just about to make everything happen for you. You could be one ladder away. You could, be, you could have been failed the mortgage in three, three different banks and go to this one and suddenly somebody turns around and says, well, I don't even know why we're giving this to you, but there you go. You could be, you could be one sentence, one phone call, one email, one text. God, can, God, God, God doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, interfere with the wills and the minds of men, but he can shift things around. And that person just on the day you go in and that nasty man from table number six is meant to be dealing with you and suddenly he takes the runs. I like it when they take the runs. It's, in other words, he's in a hurry. He got a phone call. He's got to go somewhere. Did I talk my way out of that one well? He got the runs. He has to go and somebody else takes his position. And when somebody else takes his position, you're in. God can do it. Everybody shout, God can do it. How are we doing for that? I'm closing now. My brother-in-law, one time when he was in Africa, he was going into a nation that was really closing the doors to Christians. And uh, he was going in there to do, to do some uh, evangelistic work. And they told him, going to people who was organized, told him to go through boards, said, be careful at the customs because if they, if they know what you're in to do, they'll stop you or they will imprison you. They'll just get you around the back and you'll be imprisoned, you'll disappear. And uh, uh, he, said, he said, I was going in, I was fearful because he said they took my photograph and had posters all over, the, the posters of his face was all over the place for doing the crusades. And he said, like, I was stuck. 
But he said, I prayed in advance. He said, God, you have to do something with me. You'll have to help me through this door. You're going to have to do something because I don't need to spend the rest of my life in prison. I don't want to spend my life in prison. He said, God, you help me. He said, he said so I got up. And he says, when I got up and handed over the passport, he said, this nasty individual looked at the passport and said, hmm, hmm. And he says, and he said, you can see the, you can see the, the, the wheels working on the inside. He said, come with me. And he said, they opened the door and they said, they escorted me into a room and they sat me down. He said, I was in there for three hours, three hours. And they interrogated me. What are you doing in this country? You're smuggling drugs. You're stealing babies. What are you doing? And he said, they're interrogating. They're interrogating, wanting to know. And he said, I just kept saying, I'm, I'm just, here on, just here on business. Just here on my daddy's business. My daddy sent me. I'm here on my daddy's business. We just wouldn't change it around. But they were getting aggressive now. They were getting really nasty. And this guy, he was, the guy was coming up, and he, he came to us. He says, he said, I am exasperated with this. He says, I know when you're in, what you're in here to do, and you're not in here to bring any blessing to this nation. He said, so we're going to stop you. He says, I'm going out to my tea break, and he says, I'm going to, when I come back, he said, we're going to find things out, and then we're shutting you down, we're locking you up. And he said, whenever, he, whenever that man went in, he said, I just put my hand, and I said, God, you heard his threats. And he said, I guess he said, I can't lie anymore. I'm not lying, but I can't hold the truth back anymore. He said, I tell you, when they, the next time they ask me, why are you here? He says, whatever way it goes, but I'm just going to turn around and tell them, I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And said, I'll just put it in your hands. And he said, instead of that interrogator come in, there's a younger man come in, sat down, pulled up the chair, looking as ugly as the other one, just sat down, not smiling, and said, okay, here's your file. Now tell us right now, what are you doing in this nation? And he said, I took a deep breath and said, here we go. I pushed Mac chair and I stood up and he said, I am a minister of the gospel and I've come into your nation to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to get multitudes saved. And he said, at that point, the young fellow stood to his, pushed his chair back and stood and leaned over the desk and he says, I also am a believer. Now get your bag quick and come with me before this other guy gets back and opened the door and called two guards who has carried his luggage full of Bibles to carried his luggage outside the airport and sat them down and called the cab to come over so that they could get a taxi to where he was going into his hotel. Look at somebody say, that was close. <laughs> I know. I know. But I'm here to tell you something. We're not smuggling Bibles. We're not, but we're in, we're in life's crisis. And if God can send a man to there, if God can send, he may send an angel. Oh, look at somebody say, that would be better. That would be better. He may send an angel. He may, he may send somebody. He may, he may send somebody to tell me, don't do that. He, he may get in front and say, don't marry them. He, did I look at you when I said that? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't, do, don't go there for your holidays. Don't, don't buy into this. Or he, he might send somebody else and say, this is your chance. You are the 1,000th person to walk over this depth this morning. We are giving away free mortgages. I know a person who preached in Don Hadi for years. And they had no chance of getting a mortgage. But because I was preaching stuff and our faith rose up, she said, we're going to do it. And her and her boy walked down into a downtown Belfast place and a state agent, and she walked through the door. And they said, congratulations. Do, 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 do. Congratulations. You are a cat. It was like 1,000th person. Just sit down here. She says, we are about to make this so easy for you. You can have the mortgage and sign them off on a mortgage that they weren't, would not under normal circumstance have went to. Unbelievable. Well, the same lady, her, her, uh, her son opened a business, and the business took off within days. The same woman then, her daughter uh, was, a, was a nurse and applied for a job that was posts ahead of her. She wasn't qualified for it, and they gave it to her. See, let me tell you something. God has ways of shutting things down and opening things up. This crisis of life will not kill you. It's an opportunity now for you to get closer to the Master than ever before. We have all the sympathy for you. We're not, we're not laughing at you. We're not, I'm not saying this is easy. But I'm telling you, there is a system. There's, according to the Bible, there's a way out. Number one is your daddy is your only source through this. And if you start and have intimate moments with him, he will hold your hand. People will not believe it. They'll still direct you, but you'll be directed by the Father. He will bring you through this and bring you out of this without bitterness or shame. The Bible says that the Lord, the prosperity of God, it makes rich and adds no sorrow unto. Are you with me? God's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to bless you. So this morning, my father, as we close this, 
And who knows who listened to this on YouTube or who knows who listened to this in foreign shores or through CDs or whatever. Somebody that's at, the, at a point of suicide. Somebody that's going to throw in the towel. Somebody that's at their, at their bitter end. Don't know what else has happened. God, I will believe you'll take this message and so impale it on their heart that they'll say, this is the way. And great hope will come back to them. That the Spirit of God, the benefits of heaven will be set in around them. That they'll realize God is on their side. I pray also for the people who's listening and take a note will become counselors and will be able to help people going through the dilemmas and crises of life that they'll learn the simple, the simple things to say the wisdom of God and they'll be able to say to the person try this, this and this and help them on their way we're going to believe right now if there's any persons in this building that is facing the same situation God then I believe this morning for a swift and a, a, an immediate turn around in their situations. I believe it this day in Jesus' name. Do we have anybody that that fits? Does this fit anybody's criteria this morning? And you want to stand to your feet, perhaps if you come up the front, and, and uh, there may not be anybody. This could be one of those information tapes that goes out to help people. Who knows? And, and maybe, maybe you're in a situation you don't even want to say. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm not, we're not trying to offend people. Never did. Just trying to help folks. But is anybody this morning and you're going through it, uh, personally, he say, that's me, Joe. That's me. I, that's just, I, need, I, 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 I need this things you're talking about. Then, then there is an anointing. And I keep telling when people phone us, people text us, and they live in this nation, and they've got cancers, etc., we always say the same thing. We'll talk to them, pray with them. We usually say the same thing. Can you make it into one of the services? Because I really believe there's an anointing in church that's not on a tape, and it's not on a phone call. I believe in the house of God. And I believe that the Spirit of God moves in the house of God. So if you're here this morning, and, 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 uh, uh, and it's you, stand to your feet wherever you are. There's nobody, everybody's for you in this house, by the way. And I won't even ask you what it is, okay? So you may not have told anybody. But right now you're just going through the pits, okay? Does that apply to anybody? Now you don't have to stand. You don't have to. That's okay. Don't worry about it, okay? Is there anybody else? We're for you. We want to know it. It could be any one of us going through this. Life's good. But who knows before next weekend what happens? You go through crisis calamities. Your world turns upside down. All it takes is one ladder of refusal. All it takes is some nasty person on Facebook to put something up. You don't even know. They don't even know who you are. But they can write something up there. Before you know it, you're in the pits. Is anybody else? We're going to pray. We're really going to pray. Absolutely. All right, we've got two wonderful people standing here. Maybe some of you believers, believers, and the row behind. That is a Norman, Dorothy, and the rest. Jeffrey, come on, gather around this young lady. It's good to see you back home again, all in one piece. This young lady was in Denmark. Denmark, wasn't it? She was in Denmark, fighting the lions in Denmark over there. It's good to see you home. So, would you just would you would you put your hands? Uh, 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 on these two this morning maybe some of them tremendous believers at the back girls maybe would you move over just put your hand on that young brother that's standing up there maybe whoever said yes several people turn around and look at him put put your hands on him that could be any one of us standing. that could be me standing there I, i'm not i'm we're not immune we're not immune to trials and tribulations of life everybody faces them we've faced more than our share of them over the years and i was so glad when this church prayed for me I'm not ashamed to stand there and say, come on up and pray for me now. I'm not. Now we've got a bunch of people in the back. We need people here to move back. Now they need, need to go down there and kill him. Lay hands on and kill him. How we girls getting bigger, isn't she? She's getting bigger. Look at her. Come on. Come on, guys. Come on. Move on the back. Come on, Michael. Get the back. Come on. Come on, Arnie. I hear you turned a milestone in your life there. Everybody shout, Arnie has turned a milestone in his life. We have to interrogate him to find out how old he is. But it's his birthday today. All right, you've got to hold it. That's several people there. You're just busy with your one there too. Do you, you, you want to shuffle up there? Because it's good with everybody. Is there anybody else wants to stand? Now, we, we, look, we're for you. We don't want to know what you're going through. It's none of our business. We just want you to know the love of this house. We want you to know the Holy Spirit knows he interrupted all types of stuff for this message just for you this morning to let you know. So we're going to believe right now in the name of the Lord Jesus as we lay hands on a believer. As we lay ha hands on our believer. Beverly, I, I got to read this morning. I, I was, I was, we were singing that song, You're a Good, Good Father. 
and, and, and I, I standing behind you down there and I looked at you and I thought about you. I, thought about, I said, Beverly's probably thinking about her own daddy right now. The loss of all that, that must be still horrendous inside you. Who knows what you're going through? The loss of your boy, as old Jean. And there's, there's, there's loss. And you think you're, ne- you're never coming through it, but you will come through it. You're, you're looking great this morning. You're champions. So, oh God, we, we, re- we, we reach out with them, not with sympathy. With sympathy, never done it for anybody. But we reach out with faith. And we're going to believe, oh God, just as if they were our sisters in the natural, if they were our mother or, or if they were our grand, if they so close relative, God, with all the love we have and the faith we believe for, we're reaching out right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We reach out to them with our faith and we're believing whatever the crisis is will turn and turn quickly. That this hurt that they're feeling, that the tears will begin to come back again because they're not cried out of tears. But we're going to believe the hurt will not hurt as much and there'll be a deliverance. And God, that you'll speak things peaceably to them so that they'll be able to rise up. And they, they need a yes. They need a form that just that somebody else will say, here, let me, here, here, do this. We, we're going to believe that them too will have a mortgage. Everybody shout, get a mortgage. We're going to believe that you'll get your mortgage and it'll be the right one with the right payments that you'll not be stuck for a million years into things, but you'll find the right house, you'll get the right... We're going to believe that supernatural, even if you're not supposed to have it, but the hand of God will move and you will have it for you and your family. We believe right now for your sister. This man's sister is called Grace. And Grace is now the one that's uh, uh, facing cancer. When you you know, I, I can't hardly imagine. Remember when they told Brenda she had cancer and they told her, you're going to die. There's no hope. I remember what I felt. I can't imagine what her husband, Noel, where are you, Noel? Are you in there somewhere? I see your shirt. I can't imagine what Noel felt when they said your, your wife was going to die with cancer. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine. I knew what I felt as a brother. I can't imagine what it would be to have that type of news. And maybe you've already been through it, like Jean, when her, when her son found her son dead. I can't imagine the grief and the sorrow and the sheer the terror of all that. But you're here. You're here. And life's not over. And you've got stuff to give. And you've got people to help. We're not going to believe on that. Let the Spirit of God come in in, in a compassion. But on a, on, a, on a positive note, that that favor of God will be p- p- for us. That we'll get out of this and we'll come out waving and shouting that it's over and it's finished and it's done. We believe for health and healing, dramatic touch, dramatic for healing for Grace, his sister. We believe it'll done this morning now in Jesus' name. Amen. Absolutely. Just stand there. There's no need going sitting down. We're over. I thank you for this meeting. I thank you for the hope that you bring, the life that you're putting on the inside of us. You have never left us. Oh, God, that you love us. And you demonstrate that with good things to us. So we thank you now for the blessings of heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you go shake hands with several people before you go and see you tonight at 6.30.